Welcome to a new test and teardown video. Yes, another oscilloscope. This one is a Hyung Chang model OS 620. Two channels, 20 megahertz. And it's quite modern for its age. This one is from about 1985. We got a component tester. And then the rest is more or less uh, normal. I like this uh, the colored uh, design here with the. It's quite nice uh, the graphics and the layout here is just beautiful. It's not full of a lot of uh, features and all that kind of stuff, but it's definitely doing what 99% of all the lab tasks need. It's really, really nice. I bought this um, last week uh, at a flea market and it was actually powered. So I know this one works. The rear side reveals we got the brightness control input. So that is great. Voltage selector. It, it was at 220, but that will actually over uh, drive regulators and stuff like that so i prefer to uh, to have it at the 240 and this way we uh, run regulators a little bit colder of course i will uh, experiment with this and see if it's uh, super nice with a variable mains supply and of course a modern iec connector yay so let's try my first power on so we can see the warm-up time as well Power consumption was 30 watts, quickly 24. Intensity is here. Let's have it in. Yeah, here we go. Ooh, what is that? It's probably... Ah, that is of course why. This one goes a little bit tight. Calibrate like that. Nice smooth feeling. It's not over ag oops over aggressive. That is actually really nice. This is nice. Okay, so this is of course in chop. And when I go, let's see if we aha uh -huh, dual and add of course us as well. Yeah, okay. One, two, dual. Okay, let's try and give it some input. Ha ha. So now I got signal on this scope. Let me show you something really, really funny. I got one kilohertz on one input, and I got one thousand and one hertz on the other one so there's only one hertz difference on the two inputs okay so this is channel one this is channel b since the trigger here is in let me show you the knobs a little bit more clear here so this is the trigger source this is called internal trigger source it can be either internal or b line or external trigger obviously right okay internal trigger this is channel B, and if I turn the trigger level, you'll see right here, it's responding perfectly fine. Let me go to channel A. So since this is internal, it will automatically switch the trigger source to the selected channel. Only one channel is selected. That means this is, of course, A. And again, trigger level is A. So far, so good. A, B. Now let's go dual. Now we go and get some really funny hip hoppity hip don't work trigger stuff, right? I am in internal mode. Let's go to B. Now it triggers on B, perfectly fine. Let's go back to internal and it's in weirdo weirdo. Let me remove the input signal on B. Then it works on A. So in this mode, in dual mode, and internal, 
it will more or less mix the two inputs together and this way double trick on both of them. So this is what it means. Uh, internal source, dual, yes, you will dual trick on whatever is on both of the channels. And if the signal is like this, more or less the same frequency, yes, it's gonna double trick our funny uh, unstable stuff like this. This is of course a little bit annoying and not what I want. If I go to add the added signal, oh, I got a little bit of a loose connection here, right? The added, oh, come on, baby. Where is the, here it is. The added signal will of course be like this, but there will always be something to trigger on. So far, so good. Let's try my one microsecond single pulse, just to see if there's any delay line in this uh, scope. I am now in one microsecond uh, time base. So one division here is one microsecond, and this is my pulse. See, I don't see the leading edge. I took my signal in here, so you can see the leading edge is missing, and the next pulse is here, right? So that is how it is. Let's try and test the bandwidth. This is a one megahertz uh, signal, and I'm in, still in one microsecond per division. As you see here, it's exactly spot on. So time base uh, accuracy is just fantastic. So far, so good. Let's try and see if we can, of course we need to massage the switches a little bit. I just wanna adjust the amplitude to 100%. And let's crank up the megahertz. So that was one. And let's go to 10. So it's just a little bit down here. Let's go faster. We can also do times five. Woohoo. So that is 10 megahertz. And again. Yeah, okay. Time base is still nice and accurate. So that was 10. And here is 20. Okay, it is uh, maybe 18, yeah. Okay, so that is how it is. So today, this scope is doing 18. Uh, of course, we can just go all the way up and see. Can we trick? Yes, we can. Oh, it's getting unstable. No, here we go. That is 33 megahertz. It's impossible to uh, video this, by the way. This CRT, the phosphor here, got like insane fast decay. So it's actually flickering a little bit in XY mode. And I'm I'm running this really, really fast. So that's funny. This camera here and shutter time. See? Ooh. Funny, funny. Anyway, let's have a look inside. I am now inside and it is still powered off. I've been playing around with this for quite a while. And of course it, it just smells a little bit like old electronics and I think it's quite normal. So what I've been doing is I've been trying to monitor the temperatures and down here we see some power supply and regulation stuff and that is 50 something. So that is okay. We got a little regulator here and that one is 50 celsius so that is also okay so here is the main pcb with that is the deflection and deflection that is classic they always uh, run deflection quite warm so it's uh, biased uh, for super fast and um, so here it's 90 celsius and if we look down the holes here, I don't know if we can see this, but we got a power resistors. So they know those power resistors are hot, so they try to to cool them down. And if I look through the holes, it's a hundred and something. But a hundred and something for power resistors is not insanely critical. Here is the time base. And also, uh, since the time base can run uh, quite warm, 
We also got some power resistors uh, and power circuits around here. So that is 50 Celsius. Let's see if we see the entire board. It is super revealing where is the power. The top board with time base and all that kind of stuff, that is of course horizontal uh, deflection. So down here with the inputs and uh, the multiplexing for uh, alternating or chop mode is down here as well. And that you see here with the heat sinks, that is of course vertical deflection. And those are of course also nice and warm. Oh, let me see if I can stick my fingers down here. What have we got here? 60 Celsius. And that is uh, quite all right. The reason why the heat sinks uh, look like they're cold, that is because they are shiny in the surface, so don't, they don't reflect heat. So that is, of course, not so smart. You want the heat sinks to reflect heat, so they will cool down the transistors, but they kind of don't do that. So it's, a <laughs> it's actually a little bit stupid. Here's my little trick. Just add a thin, thin layer of varnish, or this is actually my PCB repair coating. And look what happens now. Now it runs colder, but also the heat sink actually emit all the heat. So that's actually that easy. So this is the time base and horizontal deflection board again. Let's try and look a little bit more on that one. See that big heavy capacitor is just hanging in long leads like this. So that's gonna get loose on the solderings. <laughs> that is of course a classic. This is not HP or Tektronix. They wouldn't have done it like that, right? But it's quite modern with all those ICs and stuff and a single PCB just for keeping down the cost. That pod meter there is the variable time base and I definitely need to clean that because that was what was causing my loose connections. And this is the two channel analog channels input. So we got some really nice temperature matched transistors there. Ooh, we got a little amplifier chip. How nice is that? So all that with the transistors right there. And we got some diodes somewhere. Yes. We also got some diodes right there, right? So so that is actually how it's changing, it's switching the two channels. That is done by a diode matrix diode switching quite normal now we're inside the high voltage supply i don't know if that is so easy to show but we got all the high voltage capacitors standing like this for best high voltage isolation i guess the reason for the transformer to be as far away from the CRT as possible is of course to avoid magnetic interference and also note how it's orientated so we got it's could have been a lot easier just to take those four screws and just mount this transformer in the rear plate right but that is obviously not what they wanted they wanted the field to go this way if it's oriented the other way it's probably going to go that way causing a bigger field hitting the CRT with more field right so now it's this way best possible way another little detail to mention that is the mechanical finish right here you see those side panels they're mounted with two screws like this and it's just cut aluminium piece and the top piece here matches more or less okay. It's a little bit sharp here and it matches all right. But let's look at the other side. It's a little bit too long. 
Doesn't match, and it is razor sharp. If I touch this with my fingers, just a little bit, I'll probably cut myself. I try to loose the two screws here and press this piece down, but it is all the way down. It can be, actually, so that is not super perfect, if you ask me. I really wanted to show you how cool and fun and useful the component tester is, but it just didn't work. <laughs> of course, I figured out why it's not working. So the idea with the component tester is when you push the component tester button here, it will take out uh, the inputs and it will connect your inputs to the component tester, uh, the red bananas over here, right? So what I figured out is that that didn't happen. So let's try and show you guys. Here is the probe connected to the test signal. So we see some test signal here. And if I push the component tester, that just don't happen. And then I find the schematics of this uh, unit. And uh, I see how it's supposed to be wired with the, the in two inputs and the component tester. And that is exactly how it's supposed to be. When you push this, you're going to take over the inputs, no matter what those, the AC, ground, or DC, no matter how they are. So in this case, this scope is grounded, okay? So now I click component tester, and then I get an output. Isn't that funny? So here is the voltage. So one channel is the voltage. Okay, we're having a little bit of problems with the time base, by the way. That's just the switch. So, let me remove this. Now we are in component tester, and now we have activated the two inputs by selecting ground on those two, okay? So, with the input open, I get voltage on one channel, and when I short the input, like this, now I get current on the other input. Voltage, current, voltage, current, right? Let me just, it's maybe easier if I crank it down like this. So one channel here, the other channel here, okay? See, voltage and current on the two different channels. So of course the idea with the component tester is you go into XY mode. So in XY mode, the idea is you put your line in the middle and then you of course adjust this for something like plus minus three divisions so this is my voltage calibration right now i short circuit the input the component tests are like that and then i do the same with the oops like that and then i adjust this again for plus minus three divisions so now i've calibrated and now i've set up my component tester input and now I can leave it like this. So now I can take a resistor of the same impedance. I think this is 16 kilo ohms. And this is the same impedance as the, the voltage current coupler. It's actually just two resistors, not a big deal. But if I put in a resistor like that, oops, difficult to hold this at the same time, right? And then I get, of course, a straight line of equal voltage and current because of the value of the resistor, okay? So now the component tester is calibrated and uh, ready for experiments. Let's take a capacitor of 220 nanofarad. And of course, that's gonna create a circle because this is a 50 hertz uh, mains and uh, the sine wave is not a perfectly uh, sine <laughs> shaped. That is why it looks uh, a little bit like a funny ball like that. But if we did indeed use uh, 50 hertz perfect signed, this should be a perfect circle. You can also try a Xena diode. 
depending on how many volts are, I think this is a four and a half volts. So that means in one direction, we have almost no voltage and a super, super sharp cut like that. And then this is the Cena the other way around. Or if I, now it's pointing to the right. So if I take it the other way, of course the picture's gonna be the other way, right? That's the diode and that's the Cena. You can even see the shape of it. So that is very, very useful with the component tester. And here is the connector for the component tester and this is how I figure out something was not as explained in the schematic. See that is the blue wire from the AC ground DC switch and that goes directly to the input of the amplifier. It's not going to the switch as the schematic says and it's, it's the same with the blue wire for the other channel. No, it's the ground wire that comes down here that goes to the switch and then our AC signal goes like this. So that is why I knew the two switches, they need to be in ground for this to work on this particular model. It is not made as the schematic that I found. So now I'm done with this fantastic scope. I cleaned all the contacts and look at that. The time base is so, so nice and stable. Just a little bit of cleaning and then also the pots they go so smooth. This is of course a trigger level face like that. Oh, that is wonderful to feel how good it can really be. So I'm happy to say this super scope is back to life in the next 40 years maybe. Thank you very much for watching. See you soon again. Bye bye.